Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today titled Endocytosis and Endosome Tracking Roles in Coronavirus Uptake and Cell Signaling. This webinar is brought to you by APS's new journal, Function, as part of their Physiology and Focused Learning series. Function is a high caliber and broad spectrum open access journal for researchers to publish their major advances in basic translational and clinical sciences. This is Liam Sanyo, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Joining us today, we're fortunate to be joined by three presenters, Ole Peterson, professor at Cardiff School of Biosciences and editor-in-chief of Function, Rup Malik, professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and Nobel laureate Erwin Nair, director emeritus of the Department for Membrane Biophysics at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our first presenter, Ole Peterson. Ole, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you very much indeed, Liam, for this uh, kind introduction. I'll just say a few words about the journal function uh, first. It's a new journal, uh, as Liam already said, it's published by the American Physiological Society in partnership with Oxford University Press. We started out in the autumn of 2019 and uh, by appointing uh, all the different editors, and you see all the names here on the left of your screen. Today, I'm really very happy that we have with us one of our Nobel laureate consulting editor, Professor Erwin Nea. And uh, we have also got one of our editorial board members with us today, Professor Rup Malik from the Institute of Fundamental Research in uh, Mumbai. And they will be speaking uh, later in this webinar. We have only just started to publish, actually very recently, uh, but here on this screen here, you see uh, some of the papers that have already been published on, on the website. And you also see the different categories of articles we have, original articles, of course. Each of these uh, is associated with a perspective article written by a major authority in the field. We have function focus articles, which is the uh, short category of original article, uh, but a definitive finding, well documented, but not without all the ramifications you expect to find in an original full paper. And we have a new type of review article, evidence reviews, uh, which only cite original papers, with very precise referencing, so that each statement is backed up by a very clear fact, which is very clearly retrievable. And there are a number of other issues. Uh, we see here in the first issue, we have a, a obituary uh, on Jeff Bernstock, one of the giants of the 20th century physiology and pharmacology, the creator of pure nerdic signaling. So uh, I will now move immediately to the uh, talk itself. And the title here is on the screen. And I would like you to focus initially on the right of the screen, where you see a small diagram that indicates basically what I am going to talk about. So this is the basic of the endocytic process. And I will particularly focus in this webinar on uh, the ionic transports across the endosome membranes, that is the uh, accumulation of uh, acid in the endosomes mediated by the baphylomycin sensitive proton pump and the release of calcium taken up by endocytosis via two port channels, which are non-selective cation channels permeable to calcium activated by the calcium releasing messenger nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide phosphate, which we shall just call NAADP. In the next talk, Rob Malik will talk about his very exciting work on how endosomes move around inside the cell. And in the last talk in this webinar, Avine, I will talk about uh, calcium measurements, uh, calcium sensors as calcium buffers, and the technicalities of this, the pitfalls, but also how we can nevertheless uh, use this technique. Now, the first uh, important fact that I would like to alert you to is that the new coronavirus that we're all uh, uh, excited about because it uh, causes the disease COVID-19, that the uptake of this virus is completely dependent on operation of the baphylomycin-sensitive proton pump. 
And you can see in the upper left part of this diagram that if we block the function of this pump by baphylomycin, there is no uptake of the virus at all. This is not entirely surprising because previous coronaviruses were already known to operate in this way and several other viruses. But still, it's a very important fact. And in the lower left part of this diagram, you see actually what the proton pump inhibitor does. It moves the pH away from the acid range into close to neutrality. And this is uh, what prevents the virus from getting into the cell. Now, interestingly, this progressive acidification that occurs from very early endosomes to slightly later endosomes, and finally into the endosome lysosome system, is associated also with the loss of calcium. So the calcium that is taken up in the endocytic process is lost via these two pore channels. And as you can see, the reduction of calcium concentration in the endosome and the acidification uh, progress together. And what is particularly important is that if there is little calcium in the endosomes, for example, if we have exposed the cells to a solution with a low uh, calcium concentration, then acidification does not occur. And if the proton pump is blocked by baphylomycin, there is no calcium release at all. So these two processes are actually interlinked. Another type of endosome, which we have been quite interested in, are the so-called endocytic vacuoles, which have very similar processes, uh, properties uh, to the uh, endosomes, but are nevertheless somewhat different. So they're quite large structures. You can see we can induce their formation by stimulation with a hormone cholecystokinin, which is just referred to as CCK. And some of these vacuoles become very large, as you can see, almost five microns in, in diameter. Because they are so large, we can uh, use them for various interesting experiments, uh, like in the slide that is now on your screen. So in this case here, uh, the cells have been immersed in a solution containing Texas red dextran, and also in a solution containing caged calcium and a fluorescent calcium indicator. And this means that we can uncage the caged calcium by ultraviolet laser light, and as you can see to the right, this causes a dramatic rise in the calcium concentration inside the uh, endocytic structure, but it is followed by a fairly rapid calcium loss. And this is a situation, of course, where the cells are stimulated by CCK, which actually induces formation of NAADP. Now, the pancreatic acinal cells uh, are interesting in this context because we have two separate calcium signaling systems. In addition to the calcium signaling induced by CCK, which you see in the left part of the slide, where the primary intercellular uh, messenger is NAADP, we have another system stimulated by acetylcholine, which interacts with the muscarinic receptors of type 3, uh, and where the primary intercellular calcium-releasing messenger is the traditional calcium-releasing messenger, IP3, in inositol trisphosphate. These two systems create uh, calcium signals with somewhat different spatial-temporal uh, characteristics, but uh, I have no time to go into that here. What is important in the context of this talk is that the NADP antagonist, NET19, blocks the uh, calcium signals induced by CCK, but has no effect on the calcium signals induced by acetylcholine. So we have a, a nice control here in this system. We have been studying the release of calcium from intracellular stores in an other manner, namely in two photon permeabilized uh, cells. And in the upper part of this slide, you can see uh, the result of the two photon permeabilization. So we focus an infrared laser on the plasma membrane, uh, basically drill a hole in the cell. And you can see that the cell is permeabilized because in uh, image two, uh, Texas red dextron has been taken up into the cell. And as you can see in photo three, we can wash it out again. Now, in this case, we can fill up the intracellular stores with a calcium sensor, fluorescent calcium probe, and we usually use uh, two different regions of interest. The blue one uh, in photo four is in the granular area, which contains the acidic secretory granules and also endosomes, lysosomes, and other acidic organelles. 
The red area is in the basal part of the cell, which is essentially pure endoplasmic reticulum. To the left, you can see the actual uh, traces. You can see that IP3 and NADP induces calcium release, uh, and it is reversible because the calcium pump can retake the calcium that has been lost. However, if you poison the calcium pump by tapsigarkin, a very specific inhibitor of the so-called SACA pumps, then the calcium gradually leaks out of the endoplasmic reticulum. And as we can see in the very bottom panel uh, in red, if we now stimulate with NADP, there is no further calcium release. However, if we look in the granular area where we have all these acidic organelles, we can see that even after the endoplasmic reticulum has been emptied of calcium, we can still induce more uh, calcium uh, release. Uh, we can uh, check uh, what this NADP about calcium release depends on. And as you can see here in the lower right corner of the screen, uh, antibodies to two port channels markedly inhibit the NADP about calcium release and deletion of the uh, uh, two port channel uh, two uh, also dramatically reduces the NADP about calcium release. And this is a specific effect for the NADP elicited calcium release because, as you can see in the very right part of the lower part of the screen, IP3 about calcium release is not affected by uh, antibodies to two port channels. And what is important in the context of this talk is that the entry of, for example, the Ebola virus is also markedly reduced by deletion of uh, either uh, two port channel type 1 or two port channel type 2. Now also, we can use the uh, NADP antagonist, as I already uh, introduced a moment ago, NET19. And as you can see in the left part of the screen, NET19 uh, markedly uh, reduces the uh, uptake of the uh, Ebola virus, but not uh, other control virus. And to the right, you can see that the effect of NET19 is very specific for NADP in the pancreatic basal cells. It inhibits markedly NADP evoked calcium release, but has no effect on the cyclic ADP evoked release or the IP3 evoked release. We can also use another uh, inhibitor of NADP action, namely tetrandrine, which is seen in the left part of the screen. This is mainly an inhibitor of two port channels. Again, it markedly reduces uh, the uptake of the Ebola virus. There are relatively limited data at this moment in time about the SARS-CoV-2 entry, but a recent paper does show that tetrandrine, the inhibitor of two port channels, also markedly reduces the uptake of SARS-CoV-2. So in conclusion, uh, some of relatively old data, actually, about the endocytic process have uh, gained uh, new traction uh, because we now know that the proton uptake into the lysosomes and the release of calcium via two pore channels, both these processes are actually vital for the uptake of the new uh, coronavirus. There are also clear intervention points. Uh, we can block actually completely the uptake of uh, the virus by interfering with the uh, proton pump or by stopping the calcium release via the two port channels. I haven't had time really to talk about the release of the viral genome into the cytosol. This depends obviously on the fusion process between the envelope virus and the endosomal membrane and opening up there. And there are already indications that this also is critically dependent on uh, both pH and the calcium concentration. So what I think is interesting for cell physiologists is that we can, in principle, generate experiments now, for example, in pancreatic acinal cells, where we have two different calcium signaling systems and test very directly whether NADP evoked signaling has a specific role in the uptake of virus, as uh, the data I've shown you today seem to indicate. And I think I'll stop there, and I'm looking forward to hearing now the talk by Roop Malik.
Excellent. Thanks so much for a great introduction to the webinar, Ole, for sharing this research on o Ebola and the recent coronavirus. And yes, up next, I'd like to welcome our next presenter, Rup Malik. Uh, Rup, it's so great to have you with us, and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, Liam, uh, and uh, hello to everybody, and thank you to Ole for you know bringing beginning this on such a good note and telling us about the you know the initial process and the role of calcium in the uh, in in the viral replication process. So uh, I will. Uh, begin with this picture, which I took somewhere out here in India, and uh, what that shows you is a bullock and a horse paired together, carrying somebody who is sitting at the back, which you can't see. But the reason I choose this unusual uh, picture is because it is directly relevant to what I'm going to tell you about uh, today. Uh, we are going to talk about much more smaller, about you know millions of times smaller versions of these bullocks and horses, which are the motor proteins that actually transport you along the cellular roads that you see in this picture. And the choice of a bullock and a horse together is deliberate because very often dissimilar motor proteins work together or not together to bring about cellular processes. For example, uh, the, the, the transport of viral particles inside cells. Now, so this uh, is a depiction of a cell here with its membrane, with its plasma membrane out here. And the yellow half on the right side and the white half on the left side uh, signifies two different processes. Endocytosis, where you are largely taking in very small particles or fluids from the outside. Uh, or where on the right side, where you are phagocytosing much larger practices particles, let's like say mycobacterium or different kinds of bacteria. Now, there are many parallels between the process of endocytosis and what happens to you after you get endocytosed and what happens to you if you are a large solid particle and you get phagocytosed. Many of the processes are similar and, you know, many researchers have uh, looked at the markers which are acquired by these endosomes or the phagosomes uh, as a function of time as they mature inside cells and there have been many similarities. That being said, there are many things which are different as well. For example, the recycling pathway that we all are aware of in endocytosis is not so predominant in, in phagocytosis, phagocytosis. Once you get in, you basically go in. Now, we have largely concentrated on this yellow half, which is the phagocytic pathway for reasons which I will come to in a bit. Uh, but uh, there are likely, that being said, many of the factors involved in this are, are likely to be similar to endosomes. Now, if you were, you know, uh, a SARS uh, virus trying to get in into a cell, you would come in like this via endocytosis and take some of these pathways. And that is uh, shown here for a, a generic virus, let us say, not necessarily coronavirus. And uh, you get into an early endosome one and there are different stages of maturation, uh, where you shed your coat and then you, you know, you, you finally want to take your genome to a replication site, which can be in the cytosol or in the nucleus, depending on the kind of virus. And uh, uh, this entire process where you, if you are a particle, which is, let's say, tens of nanometers or maybe even larger in size, if you get it into the cell, it is not going to be easy for you to reach your destination, which may be the nucleus where you want to, rep uh, you know, where you want to replicate. So uh, to do this, you need active transport because diffusion is kind of pretty much useless. And uh, that transport is driven by the so-called motor proteins, which has been uh, the focus of my lab for, uh, for quite a while right now. So here is a video of, I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen this in, a, in the inner life of the cell. Here is a kinesin motor, you know, in this schematic carrying a lipid bound organelle and walking along a microtubule. And what you see here is pretty much generic for, I think, almost all the kinds of known viruses which uh, infect you get inside cells and then need to be taken somewhere where, you know, uh, subsequent processes will happen. Now, what is misleading about this picture here at the top is you rarely have a situation where you have a single motor carrying, let's say, a viral, you know, viral particle or bacteria or whatever inside cells. 
Uh, now, uh, this transport happens along these microtubules, and uh, in the picture uh, at the bottom, you see these cytoskeletal filaments, the microtubules in green. And let's say these are some endosomes inside which your, you know, COVID-19 might be sitting. Now, if you zoom in into one of these, and this is again a schematic, so don't take this too seriously, but there are literally going to be hundreds of proteins on the surface of, you know, a, a garden variety endosome here, okay? And many of these are, let's say here is the proton pump, and, you know, they, they are all bound to this lipid membrane. Now, the important point is that in contrast to what you see in the picture on the top left, the reality is that there are motor proteins. These are proteins that generate force to trans against this microtubule. They actually walk like you and me walk on the road and they transport this endosome. But this transport is very often seen to be in a, happening in a solitary manner where you go in one direction for some time and then you go in the other direction for some time. And this solitary motion is driven by the antagonistic and the opposing forces from the dynein and the kinesin motors, which you see here in red and in green, which respectively generate force in opposite directions in, inside the cell. The kinesin motor, the family of motors, typically generates force towards the plus end of the microtubules, which is at the periphery of the cell. So this side on the, uh, you know, the direction where the kinesin arrow points would normally be towards the periphery of the cell. But the dynein motors do the opposite. They want to take you towards the center of the cell. Now, if you're a virus coming in, you would want to probably hijack these dynein motors so that and you know utilize the force that they generate to take you towards your replication site which could be near the nucleus and once you've done your job you have multiplied etc etc and you want to get out of the cell and infect the next cell you are going to hijack the kinesin motor and you know uh, for egress and come out once the viral particles have replicated so uh, very interestingly if this black square where to if you imagine it to be a cell and if you here are uh, let's say a viral particle or any endosome coming in in this green half circle uh, what happens is very interesting is that once when you come in so let's say you come in now and you do this back and forth dance along my tables for some time and this Back and forth motion, as I alluded to in the previous slide, is driven by these dynein and the kinesin motors. So you have to imagine that the dynein is trying to pull you towards the nucleus and the kinesin the other way. And after a while, this back and forth motion seems to cease. And by this time, because of this back and forth motion, this object, the endosome or a phagosome, has interacted with many other cellular organelles, which are also moving along these microtubules. So you have to imagine something like a linear search Okay, where you walk along these microtubules and somebody else is also walking and you meet them. And this, you know, kiss and run fusions between the endosome or the phagosome and other organelles which came in earlier leads to transformation, a uh, uh, process of maturation by which you change the lipid membrane around you changes and the proteins around you change. And that change here is schematically shown by the change in color from green to yellow. Now, once you become yellow, you become a late phagosome or an endosome. And very quite remarkably, the motion of this late phagosome, the yellow guy, completely changes. And as you see here, instead of this doing this back and forth dance, you pretty much move in a unidirectional manner towards the center of the cell, which is the nucleus. And that is where these lysosomes marked in red are sitting around. And you are supposed to be, you know, if everything goes well, you're supposed to fuse with the lysosomes and then, you know, whatever nasty guy is coming in is supposed to be degraded here. Now, of course, this switch from this bidirection to the unidirectional motion is avoided by many pathogens, which are quite clever. And therefore, uh, you know, they have evolved many different strategies uh, to avoid being taken to the lysosome. In fact, some of them want to go to the lysosome and fuse with them and are quite happy there. So the, to understand this transition from the bidirectional to the unidirectional motion has, you know, it has been an unsolved problem for a long time. And this is something which we could contribute to. And I will try to tell you briefly about that. Now, yeah, so just to kind of, you know, visualize what I talked about, 
here is one such phagosome and you could see it uh, it started off somewhere here on the left side and it reached kind of near the center of the cell and this is the nucleus of the cell where it is right now sitting now this transport this is probably a late phagosome which moved in this unidirectional manner and it, because it was going towards the nucleus of the cell it is very likely that it was moved by these dynein motors which i uh, showed you in the last slide now uh, this particular problem about how these the activity of these motors the opposing activity of these motors is decided is something that has interested many people and you can completely imagine that how these antagonistic motors one which wants to take you out the other which wants to take you in their relative activity will decide where you end up inside the cell so this is a recipe for generating polarized distributions of so many kinds of organelles inside a cell and if we understand this then we have made a significant advance to do that we have been taking uh, you know different kinds of approaches at different levels of complexity starting with where very artificial system where we take plastic beads coat them with these motors the kinesins or the dyneins as i told you and look at how they move around we can also purify organelles from cells we or from animals actually we can purify lipid droplets from the liver of rats and we have made some uh, interesting findings about how the metabolic state of the animal decides whether these lipid droplets will move or not move inside the cell Uh, inside the liver actually and how that decides whether the liver will secrete very low density lipoprotein uh, triglycerides but that's a different story i won't get into that right now but one level of complexity is this very artificial situation where you take beads and coat them with motors that you have made the other is these organelles which you purify from animals or from cells and lastly what we can also do is that we can phagocytose particles which is what you see in the rightmost side and these uh, particles these are actually beads of one micron size they move rapidly inside these cells i showed you in that video and as they are moving i can shine a beam of laser light shown here in this red spot and trap these particles this is called an optical trap which is something which i want to come into the next slide so what goes on is that imagine here on the left side in the sphere that you see is a particle moving inside a cell and as you are going along this microtubule merrily along i shoot a laser from the bottom and the photons that come in get diverted when they see this particle just imagine that particle as a lens it is going to refocus the photons and that passage of the photons to this particle it generates an uh, a reactionary force which essentially traps this particle in the light field of light okay and that trapping is shown by this little spring which you see here now uh, what you see in the schematic here on the right hand side is let's say a particle it could be an endosome or a phagosome being pulled by one motor in this case or many motors and as it moves out from the center of the trap the trap pulls it back as if like a spring okay and you can actually see this happening here in in real life here is a phagosome which has been trapped at this uh, you know with this uh, this is the center of the optical trap it is in this vertical line and uh, the motor is exerting force in this direction f motor and the trap is exerting a restoring force now you see it goes out and it falls back right and this will repeat a few times and when you record this position of this object as a function of time you get data like this at the bottom right then on the left side you plot on the vertical axis you plot the distance which is this distance how far you move out from the center of the trap as a function of time okay now this distance can be converted into a force by multiplying it by the stiffness of the trap which you can calculate by different ways i will not go into that now you have to imagine that as time passes you move away from the center of the trap trap and come to a particular point and you have to imagine a spring being stretched and then you fall back because the motor detaches that's what you see in this schematic and then you can repeat this again now why do these kinds of experiments these are in my mind these are really remarkable because it is very uh, it is not easy to directly measure the activity of biological enzymes or molecules in real time 
And here is a situation where you can directly measure the force that they generate and from that infer their activity as a function of time with actually, you know, microsecond resolution. Now, largely for many years, these kinds of experiments have been done on very artificial systems and we wanted to move beyond that and try to understand how teams of motor proteins work inside cells to, you know, take things uh, to specific places in a cellular context. So what we did is that we did the same kind of experiment as you see here, but now you have to imagine rather than a single motor shown here, you have these teams of motors, the dynines shown in red and the kinesins shown in green, which are trying to do their stuff. One is trying to go this way and the other is trying to go this, that, the other way. And then you record their position or force as a function of time. Now look at the schematic here on the right, at the center here, where you see the zero, is the center of the optical trap. And if you go up, you are going towards the plus end of the microtubule, which should be towards the periphery of the cell. If you go down, you're going towards the minus end, which is towards the center of the cell. And for early phagosomes here on the left, EPs shown in black, you see that there are, you know, events happening in both directions, which immediately tells you that both the kinesin and the dynein motors are active. But on the right, for LPs shown in red, you see that most of the events happen towards the towards the dynein and towards the microtube minus end. That makes perfect sense because I told you that the phagosomes initially move back and forth, but later when they become late phagosomes, they move unidirectionally. Now, by uh, analyzing this kind of data, you can get a lot of information about the number of active motors and how their function is regulated. I will not have the time to go into that, but to show you in very brief, one of the very important findings that we've made is that this is roughly the kind of arrangement that you have on single phagosomes or endosomes, where a single kinesin motor is opposed by multiple tiny motors. Now, this is likely to happen on the envelope of the virus also. Something like this is likely to happen. Now, why is this important? Because this arrangement gives you a force balance where you have a strong kinesin motor on the right hand side opposed by multiple weak dynein motors, but their forces add up so that they can oppose the kinesin uh, so that there's a force balance. Now, this is interesting because this allows you to control things. You can add or remove the dynein's uh, in, in ones and twos, and you can either then, you know, let kinesin lead or let dynein lead depending on the number of dynein motors. Now, uh, uh, without going into too much details right now, what we were able to show that this process is, you know, intimately connected to the lipid membrane on which these motors, the dynines or the kinesins are sitting. And this switch from the bidirectional motion of the early phagosome, which you see on the left hand side, to the unidirectional motion of the late phagosomes actually happens by a very, you know, uh, unexpected method where rather than certain adapters of these proteins coming and binding and adapting, uh, you know, changing the function of the protein, it is the lipid which is, seems to be doing the job. What happens is that as the phagosomes mature, and this is also true for endosomes, that you start forming uh, cholesterol-rich domains on the phagosome or the endosome, and this dynein motor clusters into these domains because of which you have a lot of dynein motors which can now simultaneously contact the linear microtubule and they are on a rigid mechanical platform very likely which is the cholesterol rich platform and they can generate high forces to now take you towards the lysosome. So uh, just to end this is the last slide or what we were also able to show that this decision between the kinesins and the dynines, it can actually, you can explain it mathematically by the tossing of a virtual coin. Now, this is very interesting because then if you want to understand polarized distribution of organelles inside cells, let's say virus, what you need to understand is the bias of this coin. The details are not important probably at the first pass, but if you can understand the bias of this coin and what are the major factors generating a bias, they can, then you can understand how polarized distributions are generated. And of course, this bias, uh, when we do this, we can, there are many factors which can actually directly measure from experiments which are shown here, like the forces, the numbers, the tenacity, all of these, you know, add in to, you know, uh, act as this kind of a policeman who tells you where to stop and when to go. 
I will, you know, many of these things are li- very likely, and you know, there's a lot of work on this, which I don't have the time to go into, are important for the viral entry process where you get in into the virus, uh, into the cell, and you basically hijack the dynein motors to kind of get close to the nucleus to replicate. And once you're done, you use the other motor to get out. These are issues which I don't directly study in my lab, but uh, there are very interesting leads which others have obtained. Unfortunately, I won't be able to get into that uh, right now. And I will end and thank you for your attention. And I would like to uh, you know, show this picture where we are in this constant tug of war where half of my lab works on something, the other half works on something else. Imagine these as the kinesins and these as the dynines. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And I would like to hand over to Erwin for his talk. Fantastic. Thanks so much Rup, for the presentation and for sharing your research, looking at the molecular motors driving vesicular transport. And with that, yes, I'm very pleased to introduce Erwin Nair. And Erwin, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Well, it's my pleasure to contribute to this session on endocytosis. Also, I did not work on endocytosis for quite some time, but I think what I can try to convey is a few insights into the way we try to manipulate calcium signals. And uh, if you have listened to uh, um, Ole's talk, it's clear that calcium plays a big role in all these processes that we are interested in. Um, so what I'm going to do is point out a few peculiarities of uh, 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 calcium signal. So um, uh, what distinguishes them from pH buffers? I mean, probably most of you are used to use buffers, uh, uh, pH buffers, to uh, precisely set the uh, concentration of protons. Now, pH buffers, uh, if you introduce them into living cells, they cannot achieve this uh, because they are embedded in uh, an environment which is controlled by uh, many factors, in particularly also calcium removal mechanisms. But um, so uh, if they don't precisely control pH, what do they do? Um, First of all, of course, they, if there are buffers uh, in the cell, they prevent excessive calcium concentrations. Um, if when, for instance, calcium channels are open and there is a bout of calcium influx, uh, they shape the dynamics of the calcium signals. They shape the rise time. They uh, shape the time course of um, um, uh, uh, calcium decline and if these buffers, these calcium binding proteins happen to be fluorescent in a calcium dependent way, uh, they can act as uh, calcium indicators. Um, so I will uh, elaborate on this and unfortunately will have to end up with some bad news, which however is also compensated by a little bit of good news. So. Uh, before going into details, let me uh, summarize how we load buffers into the cell, how buffers uh, can be brought into the cells. And here is, of course, one method which is widely used, um, uh, originally introduced by the late Roger Chen, and this is using acetoxyl um, uh, esters of calcium chelators. Compounds in which the uh, COOH groups are esterified and so have no longer carry their uh, charges. As uncharged species, they can uh, enter, they can cross the membrane and inside the cell can be split um, uh, um, um, uh, and so be converted into what they are, namely calcium chelators. Um, another way to bring uh, uh, buffers into the cell is dialyzing the cell uh, with chelators in the whole cell patch clamp configuration. That means you have chelators like BAPTA or EGTA in the whole cell uh, patch pipette 
and uh, in whole cell configuration, you just bring in these substances into the cell. Um, another way of uh, endowing cells with calcium buffers is expressing calcium binding proteins uh, such as parvalbumin or calretinin or um, uh, calmodulin, which may not be such a wise idea to bring in calmodulin because it, of course, does not act only as buffer but also controls many cell uh, processes. Uh, so when you then look what happens uh, if you um, first study a cell in the wild type configuration uh, and then bring in buffers. What you see here is on the right side uh, a recording uh, from paper by um, 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 Martin Müller and Ralf Schneckenburger in 2017 seven, who measured calcium transients uh, in the nerve terminal, in the uh, calyx of health nerve terminals upon arrival of an action potential. So what you can see in uh, panel A on the right side is that in the response to this uh, action potential, there is a rise in calcium concentration to about of about 0.5 micromolar, and this then decays back to um, a, 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 a ground level with a time constant of some 100 milliseconds. Now, if you um, uh, do the same experiment in the presence of 100 micromolar EGTA, which is a so-called slow buffer, a slow buffer because its kinetics of binding calcium and releasing calcium is in the seconds range. So that's slow with respect to um, the rise and fall of the calcium signal during action potential. And if you look at this uh, a graph in panel B, you see that the amplitude of the signal, the amplitude of the calcium rise is about the same as in the case A, where there's no uh, uh, added buffer. But, and this is because it's a slow buffer, it cannot catch the calcium as, uh, as it comes in right away. But in the subsequent 10, 20 milliseconds, uh, it binds calcium, removes um, uh, calcium from the free calcium pool, so that there is a rapid phase of a decrease, however, followed by a very slow tail. Um, if you do the same experiment with uh, um, uh, uh, parvalbumin, which is also a slow calcium buffer, but a calcium binding protein, you see a very similar uh, um, uh, response. If, however, you bring in a fast buffer, like the calcium indicator Difura 2, then the uptake uh, Difura 2 happens uh, in the millisecond and submillisecond range. And as a consequence, you see uh, only a very, very small increase in calcium. However, if you look at this in expanded amplitude scale, you see that this tiny increase decays very, very slowly um, back to baseline. And uh, actually, if you do uh, uh, a quantitative analysis, you find that the amplitude of this calcium transient in the presence of 50 micromolar for a 2 is reduced by about a factor of 20, while at the same time the decay of the signal back to baseline level is uh, slowed down by a factor of 20, so that uh, the area under this transient actually stays constant is not influenced by the presence of the buffer. And uh, this is uh, uh, basically the main message which I uh, want to give, namely that presence of buffer does not change the area under uh, uh, the curve, which is, uh, of course, uh, important for the effect of uh, the calcium and the presence uh, of the buffer. Um, so, um, 
back to consequences of calcium buffering. Um, in this sense, which I just explained, a presence of calcium buffers um, um, uh, avoids excessive changes. Um, but I want to argue that uh, presence of buffers may also be quite negligible. Uh, and I try to explain this why. As I mentioned, the uh, uh, buffer reduces the amplitude and slows down the decay by the same factor. So this uh, can be proven mathematically, but it's also quite easy to understand uh, intuitively. Uh, once a calcium enters into the cell, it is uh, taken up by the indicator, which means that as long as it's bound to the indicator, it cannot be removed by the pump. So, uh, but it is in equilibrium uh, uh, between bound to the indicator and free cal calcium indicator. And in order for the pump to do its job, the uh, any given calcium uh, ion has to be a certain fraction of the time, a certain uh, a, a time in the free state so that it can be uh, taken up by the pump and uh, uh, taken out of the cell. And um, uh, so the same fraction which reduces the number of um, uh, 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 free uh, uh, protons also then delays the removal of the protons. Okay, so what does this imply? Uh, the area is not changed, but it has consequences, uh, or what are the consequences on the effector system? Say, if you have a process which is enhanced by uh, calcium, um, its action uh, or it's the effect of a calcium change is, uh, if that is supralinear, uh, uh, just like the triggering of exocytosis, which goes with the third or fourth power of calcium, the presence of a buffer is, of course, inhibiting because uh, the presence of the buffer avoids the high rises in calcium, which... Uh, uh, are usually or without the buffer present for a short time, you know, and um, there is no compensation of this reduction. If you have an effector system which is sublinear, for instance, calcium pumps which saturate at high calcium, the presence of the buffer may actually be stimulating because uh, the high saturating concentrations are avoided while at the same time the uh, time uh, uh, spent uh, or the time uh, uh, in which calcium is in the right linear range of the pump is increased. So the net effect is a stimulation. If you, however, have a system which is linear in calcium, like many systems are, and particularly which basically all calcium effect in the low concentration range uh, are, then there may be very little effect because the effects of reducing amplitude and lengthening the uh, uh, transient uh, exactly uh, 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 even uh, it out. So with this, let me um, uh, come to the role of... of uh, calcium indicators. And here is the bad news, as described very lucidly in a recent paper by Shane McMahon and Meyer B. Jackson. Um, it is uh, said that uh, there is an inconvenient truth, namely that calcium sensors are calcium buffers with all the consequences uh, which I just uh, mentioned. You may remember the case of the signal with FURA uh, 2, 50 micromolar FURA 2, which uh, decreases the amplitude of a calcium signal by a factor of 20 and lengthens it by a factor of 20. So that means if you have 50 micromolar 
uh, for a two in your cell, which is a concentration which is often needed to get a good signal, you have strongly distorted signal. You, you have reduced its amplitude by about a factor of 20. So um, this may be uh, a, a very, as it said here, a very inconvenient truth. But uh, there is also some good news. Uh, uh, or when asked the question, why does everybody using not so low uh, concentrations of calcium indicator dyes get away with it? Um, namely, I have to come back to my main message that linear effector systems are hardly affected by the presence of the buffers. So although you measure the wrong signal, highly distorted signal, um, the uh, what what the indicator uh, uh, tells you, nevertheless, is a signal, a message, which relates closely to the effect of calcium um, uh, on uh, the system you are studying. So with this, I think I am finished. And next uh, is the question and answers uh, session, I guess. Excellent. Thanks so much, Erwin, for the fantastic presentation on calcium buffers and their consequences on exo and endocytosis studies. And yes, now we're going to move on to the Q&A session. Okay, so let's jump in. Uh, first question today is for Ole. Uh, the question being, which of the, the transport proteins that you mentioned do you think provides the most attractive molecular target for developing a potential therapy or prevention against COVID-19? You know, the most uh, attractive target as such would be the, the proton pump, since the inhibition of that pump really totally abolishes uh, virus uptake. Uh, Bafilomycin is an antibiotic and uh, has been used, but unfortunately it is fairly toxic. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it has been difficult actually to make modifications of bafilomycin that are entirely safe to use, but that, uh, that could still happen. And that could, in principle, be a uh, very interesting solution. Uh, two port channels uh, have frequently been mentioned as potential targets, and there are uh, inhibitors of these two port channels. And uh, again, I think that is a realistic possibility, which has so far not been exploited to the uh, extent that perhaps is, is desirable. But I think both of these ta are, are potential targets, which could actually prove quite important. Excellent. Great answer. Uh, Erwin and Rup, do you have anything to add on to that? Well, I mean, uh, bl blocking, yeah, the ahead, pump, ahead, uh, blocking the proton pump may not be so good, good an idea because uh, it's involved in so many things, you know, and how would you hit the virus specifically without uh, messing up everything else? Yes, that, that, is, that is certainly true. However, uh, it could be that there is a kind of short window of opportunity where you could, in a sort of short time frame, uh, use it. Uh, it's clearly a, 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 a toxic procedure, uh, which, of course, most uh, interventions are at some point. But uh, sometimes there can be a balance of opportunities. I'm not at all sure that this will be the answer, but I think it is a potential uh, intervention. Very interesting. Yeah, and there's a, a similar question here that came in uh, near the end of Rup's presentation. So Rup, I'll address this one to you. Uh, but if you did manipulate the calcium signal or the calcium concentration, how uh, would unaffected cells not be affected? Uh, would that lead to side effects? Uh, and could it be a, a possible strategy to block calcium or cholesterol channels to help treat COVID-19? It is difficult for me to answer this question because this, you know, this finding that the, the cholesterol effect, which I talked about is just a few years old. And I don't know of any direct evidence where the calcium levels can play around with the organization of cholesterol on the membrane. But that's an interesting idea. Unfortunately, I don't have a direct answer for this. I will be very honest. Excellent. Ole or Erwin, anything to contribute to this one? 
Well, I mean, uh, clearly calcium is uh, crucial. So uh, I think uh, manipulation of calcium is a possibility. But the only way you can do it is probably in practice by interfering with the uh, transport proteins. Uh, clearly inhibitors of calcium channels are widely used in therapies of all sorts of different uh, diseases. So for that reason, I think, for example, that uh, uh, hitting uh, two port channels is a possibility since they are obviously important in a lot of different functions, but not necessarily absolutely essential for all cell functions. Excellent. Thanks. Um, next question, Erwin, I'll direct this one to you. Uh, why mm -hmm. do you claim that the presence of calcium buffers has no effect or very little effect in some situations? Well, I try to explain this, you know, um, um, because the buffers take up the calcium um, so that reduces the amplitude of the signal, but uh, at the same time, it delays, it lengthens the action um, because, as I explained, um, in the end effect, a proton entering the cell will have to be taken out through pumps, you know, and uh, for that reason, a given ion has to stay a certain time in the cytosol, and during that same time, it also uh, can do its action on a process you are interested in, you know. So, it's the equivalence of uh, uh, the, the kind of fraction of calcium being available for uh, uh, being taken out with the fraction of calcium being active in a process. So I hope this uh, intuitive explanation is uh, 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 catching on. You know, of course, you can formulate this in a few simple equations uh, and, and, and prove that. Excellent. Yeah, great answer. Um, Ole, I'll direct this next question to you here, but do you know if there's any evidence for calcium involvement for COVID-19 in lung epithelial cells? Well, I would imagine that it would be a very similar situation. Of course, the pancreatic acinal cells I talk about are epithelial cells. Uh, so in the epithelial cells, the virus would be taken up by endocytosis as, as it is in, 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 in all different cell types. So I think uh, what I talked about would probably be generally uh, the case in, in, in all different uh, cell types. Uh, what is still uh, very much uh, unclear at the moment is uh, what type of endocytosis process is used. There's obviously class three independent uh, endocytosis and class three independent endocytosis. And uh, there are sort of different data from different groups and different cell types about the exact proportion between these. But uh, the general fact that all uh, endocytic virus uptake is dependent on both the pH and, and, and the calcium, I think that is uh, a general rule and as such is applicable to considerations of infection of any cell type. Excellent. All right. And I think in the interest of time, we'll just have a, a few more questions here. Uh, we have gotten a lot of great questions come in, but uh, here's a, a recent one. Uh, does exocytosis play a role in coronavirus spread or do the cells just uh, kind of explode? And if exocytosis does play a role, are there any putative exocytosis mechanisms that could be targeted? Um, maybe, Rup, I'll direct this one to you first. Uh, I, I think there is a mechanism of exocytosis. This is not very clearly understood about targeting it exactly. I think it's too early to, uh, to comment on that. But uh, I don't think this is a mechanism where the cells, basically the virus keeps multiplying and it, you know, the cell basically bursts. So uh, it is an exocytic mechanism. But uh, that again, that being said, uh, this the, the processes that regulate this exocytosis are partly understood for many other different kinds of viruses, including some of the SARS family of viruses. And uh, it is likely to be, uh, therefore, an exocytic process. Excellent. And Ole uh, or Erwin, do you have anything to add on to this? 
No, not really. I think uh, Rob has explained this as well as he can at this point in time with the knowledge that we have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, and I think maybe, yeah, we'll make this the next, the last question. Um, and this one's for Ole. Are there any other cell types apart from the pancreatic Essner cells in which NADP plays an important physiological role uh, and which could therefore be used for further exploration of NADP's role in virus infection? Yeah, I mean, there is a very important cell that uh, uses NADP as an intracellular messenger, and that is our other, other T cells. So uh, T cells, which obviously play a huge role in uh, the fight against infection, uh, they operate in a calcium uh, manner, and the calcium entry is dependent on an NADP evoked uh, release inside the cells. So they could be extremely interesting cells to look at. Uh, however, unlike the pancreatic Asian cells, to the best of my knowledge, they don't have these two very separate calcium signaling systems, which provide particular opportunities for a kind of test and control experiments in the in the very same cell and even in the same time frame. But the T cells are definitely of, of, of very great interest in this context. Excellent, great answer. All right, well, thanks so much, Olav Rup and Erwin, for all your fantastic insights today, uh, both in your presentations as well as this great uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And a big thank you to everyone for joining us today to attend the webinar. And we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.